Uh, we're glad you're here for the morning service, and we hope today that you'll be blessed. I am so glad that God loves us. I'm so glad that God is our friend. I'm so glad that God has created happiness and joy. He says that laughter is good medicine. A cheerful heart is good medicine. And he also says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Now, since we started doing our uh, tapes of the messages for the services, uh, I gotta be honest with you, it's a little bit uh, hard sometimes to, uh, to not be stiff when you're kind of uh, realizing that you're talking to folks out there, but you don't have people standing here. We're glad that you're out there. We're glad that you took the time to find us on YouTube and Facebook, and we appreciate it. I have a little uh, story today I want to read. I always like to have something that's kind of funny. Hope you get a chuckle out of it and uh, realize that your laughing is releasing endorphins, which God created as the healer of our bodies. This little story probably is one of my favorites. Two brothers had terrorized a small town for decades. They were unfaithful to their wives. They were abusive to their children and dishonest in their business. When the younger brother died quite unexpectedly, the surviving brother went to the pastor of a local church. He said, I'd like to have you pastor conduct my brother's funeral, but it's important to me that during the service, you tell everybody my brother was a saint. <laughs> but the minister replied, he was far from that. Well, the wealthy brother pulled out his checkbook and began writing a check. He said, Reverend, I'm prepared to give you this check for $100,000. Your church can use it any way it wants. All I'm asking is that you publicly state, my brother was a saint. <clears throat> well, on the day of the funeral, the pastor began the eulogy this way. Everybody here knows that the deceased was a wicked man. He was a womanizer and he was a drunk. He terrorized his employees and he cheated on his taxes. But then he paused. But as evil and sinful as this man was, compared to his older brother, he was a saint. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I love that. It's one of my favorite jokes. I'm glad you can laugh and smile. Today we're going to read the Word of God and study the Word of God. And uh, as is custom at our church, I want to hold this book up and say our little uh thing that we say every service for this uh, at church service for before we lift up the word of God. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Thank you. I know you, some of you out there were saying that along with me, and we mean it from our heart. Well, today I'm going to be talking about one of the great men of the Old Testament, uh, the prophet Elijah. And he is one of my favorite men uh, in the Bible. And I love this particular story about the ministry that he had to Israel. If you go back to the 17th and 18th chapters of 1 Kings, and if you want to read, you're going to find out that uh, God had gotten fed up with a king that had uh, come on the scene. His name was Ahab. And uh, it was, his, his reign was horrible. 
It says in the scripture that uh, as the Lord God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain for the next few years except at my word. Uh, he said that because the, the Bible says that uh, God had gotten basically fed up with uh, Ahab. Uh, Ahab, the son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to, to commit sins, but he had the gall to marry a foreign wife whose name was Jezebel, daughter of Ithbel, king of the S Sidonians and began to serve Baal and worship him. And then he went further than that. The scripture says, not only did he serve Baal, but he built a, uh, an altar to, uh, in Samaria to Asherah and put a pole there. And it said he did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger God than did all the kings of Israel before him. God had gotten fed up with him and God was going to pass judgment on the, his reign as king and on Israel. I will tell you something. God is in control. God makes the decisions. I have told folks here, I've been talking to them about this uh, virus that we have uh, and, and I've been real honest with them. Uh, I'm not afraid of the virus. Uh, I believe that my life is in God's hands and God will call me home when he wants to call me home. He may choose to use this virus to do it. I don't know. But I know this, to be absent in the flesh is to be present with the Lord. I know that when this life is over, I am going straight to heaven. I made peace a long time ago when I was 12 years old. Uh, I met Jesus personally. God revealed himself to me. There was no question about it. And I asked Jesus into my heart and he changed my heart. He made me a different person, put me on a different path. And then five years later said, I want you to be in the ministry, something that I did not want to do. I have served God. I have had a great life. I have enjoyed being at Crossroads Community Church. Here I am uh, beginning my 30th year at Crossroads. We started the church in 1991. Can you believe that? Uh, and I'm going to be beginning my 30th year. 29 years in one place. I said that back then, I'm not going to go to Yuba City. I came up here. They were starting the little church and uh, they wanted me to, to, to preach. And I came up here and I've been here ever since. And uh, I love God, and God is in control. God can judge a nation, and God can bless a nation. Today, we're in the middle of this virus. To me, it's like a plague. And I read about a lot of them in the Old Testament. Plagues that came upon Israel. Plagues that came upon Egypt. Uh, and I realized that God, in each case, was in control. God's in control today. Elijah had passed judgment on Ahab at God's command, and they told Ahab that the judgment would be that Israel would go into a drought for a long time, and the drought would not be lifted until he gave the word. If you study the 17th chapter of the book of First Kings, you'll find out the drought was long. Before long, the streams dried up. Before long, crops were dying. They were diseased. There was famine in the land, and people were miserable. God did not lift the drought. The drought went on for three and one half years. That is a long time for God to pass his judgment. And the fact of the matter is, it fell on both the good and the bad. It fell on believers and unbelievers because God was in control. Now, the scripture we're going to share today is the scripture uh, in 1 Kings chapter 18 that deals 
with uh, Ahab the king being confronted by Elijah the prophet. The scripture says very carefully that God uh, set up a meeting. Obadiah helped put it together. And God set up a meeting between King Ahab and the prophet Elijah. Ahab had been trying to get rid of Elijah. Uh, Jezebel had been trying to get rid of Elijah. God protected him. And now God wanted to have a meeting between these two men, King Ahab and the prophet of Israel, Elijah. As soon as they met, the scripture says, Ahab looked up and said, Oh, here you are, O troubler of Israel. Quickly, Elijah spoke back. I'm not the troubler. Uh, you are. You and your family and you, your reign has been awful. God is upset. You have led the people away from God and you've sent them to other gods, Baal and Asherah. And God, God is upset with you. Now he said, we're going to settle this. And he said very boldly to the king, he said, we're going to have a contest today. We are going to find out whose God is real. Is it the 450 prophets of Baal's God? Is it the 400 prophets that believe in Asherah? Is this God? Or is it the God of Israel, the creator, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Well, today we're going to find out. He said, I want you to get all the people of Israel together. I want them all out here. I want them all to see God and see which one is the real one. So Ahab responded and said, yeah, let's get it on, basically. And Elijah waited and all the people of Israel gathered together at the command of the king to listen to Elijah. The scripture says Elijah looked at the folks and he told them, today we're going to see who God is. And the scripture reads this way. They were assembled at Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people, and here's what he said. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal and Asherah is God, follow them. He looked out at the people, and they said nothing. They said nothing. They didn't stand up for God, the God of Israel. They didn't stand up for Baal and Asherah. They said nothing. I thought about that a lot. Uh, sometimes today when we're confronted with difficult things, we freeze. You freeze when you have fear. You freeze when you are afraid. You freeze when we, you think you might offend somebody. In other words, you can't take a stand and you can't make a decision. You're a chicken. Elijah had asked them, if God is God, serve him. If Baal and Asherah is God, serve them. And the people of Israel said nothing. God said, well, today, you're going to find out who God is. He said, we're going to have a little contest here. We're going to have a contest between the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah. That's 850 false prophets and me. And I, it seems that I'm the only one standing up for God. So the odds aren't real good if you look at the the face value of this, it's 850 to 1. But I am going to show you who God is. See, Elijah believed in his heart 
that Elijah the prophet plus one, God, was the majority no matter what. And so he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a little contest. I want you to go and get two fine bulls. I want you to bring them here. And then I want the prophets of Baal and Asherah to come forward. And I want them to pick which one of the bulls they want. They get first choice. They get pick of the litter. I don't want anybody saying that we cheated or we tricked them. They get the best one if they want the best one. We'll take the one that's left. And here's what the contest is. Very simple. We're both to build an altar. We're both to put wood on the altar. We're to cut up the bull and place the meat on the altar. And then neither side's going to light a fire to start the fire to for the sacrifice. We're going to see whose God lights the fire. And whose God lights the fire will tell us who the real God is. Now, here's the deal. I want the prophets of Baal and Asherah to go first. I want to give them plenty of time. I don't want anybody to be able to point a finger and said we somehow tricked them or cheated them. You guys get first choice. Go build your altar, prepare your bowl, get ready. And it was going to start about 9 a.m. Elijah decided to wait. Well, the prophets of Baal and Asherah began to uh, call on their God. They call on the name of Baal and they call on Asherah. And they said, oh, Baal, answer us. And they shouted at the top of their lungs, but <laughs> there was no response. There was no answer. They danced around the altar and they made all kinds of commotion but there was no response. It was about 12 noon when Elijah began to taunt them. Now you got to understand here for a minute. Either Elijah is crazy or he's a man that has a lot of faith. He began to taunt them after they had been praying and doing the, all the religious stuff and shouting for three hours. He began to taunt them. I, I read this in a lot of different versions because I, I wanted to really see what it was said. He said, he started off by telling them, you need to get louder. Shout louder. And then he said, uh, maybe, possibly, your God is in a deep thought. <laughs> maybe he's real busy and can't stop what he's doing for you. Maybe he's traveling. And then he said, maybe he's, uh, he's asleep and you need to wake him up. I was reading one of the living translations and uh, it said that he said maybe your God is relieving himself maybe he's sitting on the toilet anyway he made fun of their God because their God was not responding well the scripture says that they began to really get into a frenzy they verse 28 said they shouted louder they began to slash themselves with their swords and with their spears. And you thought to yourself, wow, uh, they are really into this. But the scripture says very clearly, this was their custom. So they were cutters. They would cut themselves and they would think that when they bled and when they had pain, this would catch the attention of their God. But guess what? Their God didn't respond. It's getting later in the day, midday passed. They continued their frantic prophecies until the time of the evening sacrifice came. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then in verse 30 of chapter 18, the Bible says, Elijah said to all the people, now come here to me. And all the people of Israel came close to watch and to hear Elijah. 
he wanted them to see what he was doing. The first thing that he did was he began to repair God's altar. It was left in disarray. No one had taken care of it. People hadn't been offering sacrifices to God. They, they, they had turned and were doing their own things. You know, we get that way sometimes. We, uh, we, we, we say we love God and we serve God, but we let stuff and things uh, get in the way of God. The scripture says you can't love God and mammon, which is money. It says you're going to either love God or you love mammon or money, but you can't do both. God is going to either be number one and be your God or he's not going to be your God at all. Now, there's nothing wrong with having money. If you have money, you can help people. You can do good things. You can support God's ministry. You can help it go forward. You can be a good steward of what God is giving you. But you have to remember the money, the stuff, and the things that you receive were created by God. In the beginning, the scripture says, God spoke everything into existence out of nothing. It all belongs to God. Now, when we're faithful stewards and we serve God, the scripture says God gives us something. He wants to see what we're going to do with it. Are we going to be people who hoard it? Are we going to be people who, who, uh, who won't give anybody, we're selfish, we won't give anything out to anybody? Or are we going to be people that will not only use it for good, but bless others with it, bless the ministry with it? What are we going to do with it? The scripture says when you're faithful over a little, God will make you ruler over much. I have a lot of good friends that are great believers in God, and God has blessed them literally richly. They, they now are, they have earned lots of money. They've invested a lot of their money. They've bought lands. They've bought houses. And they, they have a lot of wealth. But they give out of their wealth to bless other things. I've seen them uh, send money to our orphanage, for, for instance. I've seen uh, people that, that send money to the mission field. I've seen money the people that have put water wells in for uh, people in countries where they don't have good fresh water. I've seen people that have bought Bibles to be given out and shared. I've seen people that use their money to bless others and bless the work of the kingdom. I think that when people have that kind of a heart, God just don't bless them with more money. More money that they can share, more money that they can bless others with. You have to be faithful over what you have. Now this altar, this altar, which represented a place to commune or to meet God, a place to offer your sacrifice as, as the uh, folks of Israel did, uh, to God, to acknowledge to God that I am miserable, I am, uh, I'm a sinner. I have done wrong and acknowledge that God is the true God for us to worship. These altars laid in ruin because nobody had taken care of them. No longer were they worshiping on the Sabbath. No longer were they giving the best that they had. No longer were they tithing. Uh, they had left all this go and they were doing their own thing. The first thing that Elijah the prophet did was stop and rebuild the altar of God. He rebuilt the altar in the name of the Lord. And then it says he had them, this was an unusual thing, he had them dig a large trench around it. And then it says he took wood and he arranged it there at the altar he cut the meat of the bull into pieces, laid it on the wood. And all this was done on an altar built with 12 stones, 12 rocks, which represented the 12 sons, the 12 sons that were now the representation to God of the of Israel this 
The 12, now the tribes of Israel, were represented here by 12 rocks on the altar. Now here's a strange thing that happened. He had them go get four large containers. In this version, it calls them jars. They were very large jars, if they were jars. They, held, they would hold a lot of liquid. And he said, I want you to go and get water. So they had to travel some distance to fill these things up with water. Remember, they've had three and a half years of drought. And so they go and bring these four large jars. And he said, I want you to douse the sacrifice. I want you to douse the wood. And I want it to be soaking wet. And so they dumped four large jars jars of water on the sacrifice. Now he said, I want you to go do it again. <laughs> okay. So they went and got four more big containers of water and came back. He said, douse it again. And then he said, I want you to go and get four more. This is a total of 12. 12 is always a number of God. Remember how many tribes there were? 12. 12 is always a complete number, a number that God uses. He said, pour that water on there. Now I'll tell you, the sacrifice was sopping wet. The wood was so wet you could never start a fire with it. And then the water that was left completely filled the trench that was there until the trench was running over. What in the world was Elijah doing? Well, I'll tell you what he was doing. He was catching the attention of these 12 tribes, 12 containers of water that douse the wood and the sacrifice. What was he trying to do? He's going to show these folks what God can do. Now, if you and I were going to start a fire we would need dry wood. We would need to go and uh, cut some little pieces of wood or maybe get some, some dry leaves or some dry grass and come and use something to try to get that fire started. Now, today when we barbecue, you know, we go get some Kingsford lighting fuel or something and we spray it all over the wood. Maybe we have some charcoal that we spray that on there to get a fire going. And, uh, and we get fire. he didn't want that. He didn't want there to be any hint that he or anybody else had anything to do with burning the sacrifice. It had to be God. He wanted the false prophets to see it would be God. So the scripture says that after he had literally soaked the wood with water and he caught the extra water so there would be water left over in the trench, he said, now is a time for the sacrifice. And he said, I'm gonna pray. And so Elijah said a pretty simple prayer. I'm gonna read it to you. It's in verse 36. O Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel, let it be known today that you are the God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Before we finish that prayer, I want you to hear what he's saying. It's all about showing these people God. What happened to Israel was Israel had fallen away from worshiping God. They had worshiped false gods, Baal and Asherah. Their hearts were far from God so that when he asked them who did they serve, they couldn't answer because they knew inside their hearts were not close to God. Folks, you that are listening to this today, you know when your hearts are away from God. You know when that fire that's in you 
It's growing very, very dim. If you have found the Lord in your life, you remember that day that you met Jesus and he came into your heart and he forgave your sins and all of a sudden you knew God was real and you knew that the Lord was in your heart and you knew you were forgiven. You remember that day. Your heart was on fire. Sometimes we call that revival. Your heart was set ablaze. And you know you have been close to God. I remember looking back to Moses when Moses led the people out of the bondage of Pharaoh. God had sent 12 plagues and he was delivered. He went across through the Red Sea. The Red Sea closed back up on his enemies. God provided water out of the rock. He provided manna from heaven. You know the story very well. And Moses was God's leader, great leader. Moses was God's man. Moses loved God. You remember that God decided to give the Ten Commandments carved into stone to Moses. Moses was up on Mount Sinai for quite a while. I think some of the folks even wondered if, if he was okay. Do we need to go up there? But Moses had gone up to get close to God. He wanted God to speak to him. He wanted to hear from God. And he was up there for quite a while. And he spent time in prayer. He spent time thinking about God and talking to God and listening to God. The scripture says that when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments, he literally had a holy glow about him. He couldn't tell it. He couldn't see it. But people that saw him had to shade their eyes because he glowed, and the glow was from being close to the Lord. Folks, when you get close to the Lord, when you get into the Word and study it and God speaks to you, when you begin to pray and God begins to talk to your heart, when you listen to the Word of God being taught or preached, you can get close to God. And God can literally set you on fire to the point that anybody that comes in contact with you feels the very presence of God. Moses in this prayer, or Elijah in this prayer, is simply asking God, God, I need you. I need you to set these people's hearts on fire. I need you to show them that you are God. And Lord, I'm praying that you will turn their hearts back again. Folks, I'm praying that the Lord will use this time when we're dealing with a virus when men have said that we cannot hold church. I've got to be honest with you, it bothers me a lot that we can't hold church. Uh, one of the things about our country that's really great is we have freedom. Freedom to be what we want to be. Freedom to choose. And it says in the Word or in the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights, that we have certain rights that come from God, and one of them is that we can worship God freely and assemble and worship God. It bothers me when government officials come in and they say, we're going to shut down all the businesses and all the things that maybe aren't important, and the things that we have to have we'll leave open. And then our governor in the state of California Governor Newsom makes a list of stuff that is important. We have to keep open. In that list, it says that uh, surgeries, which are necessary, can be performed, but any elective surgery can't be done. And then he goes on to say, oh, yes, those, those uh, abortion clinics, those abortion clinics, 
they can stay open because the, what they're doing is important. But they turn around and look at the church and say, oh yes, the church, theirs isn't important. The church, uh, no, we don't have to have that. The church has been relegated to being unimportant. I'm telling you that our, the founders of our country in the very beginning said, we have the right to worship God and we have the right to assemble as we worship God. And I personally am not going to give that up. I am praying that God changes the hearts of some of these leaders. I'm hoping that God shows them who he is. King Ahab is watching. The 450 prophets of Baal are watching. The 400 prophets of Asherah are watching. All the people of Israel are watching. He prays a prayer asking God to use this time to draw their hearts back to God. He's praying that this would be the time that God would be revealed to the people. And he would be revealed as the prophet of God and that he had done this at God's command. And he says to God, answer me. God, answer me. Let these people know you are God. and that You are turning their hearts back again. Verse 38 says this, very simple. Then <laughs> the Lord sent fire. It fell and it burned up the sacrifice. Let me, let me just tell you what happened. They're all there. They're watching. They've, they've got their eyes glued on the sacrifice. Some are mumbling and talking about, well, how come we're put at a disadvantage with water on our sacrifice? Their sacrifice was dry. I can just hear people talking. But they were watching the sacrifice and they heard this prayer. And then all of a sudden a ball of fire came down from heaven. It had to be pretty hot because it explained what it did. It came down from heaven and it lit on the sacrifice. And it says it was so hot that it burned up all the meat. It was so hot that it disintegrated the 12 stones and it burned up the dirt and it licked up the water. It, or it, it caused all the water to turn to steam and go away. God responded yes to his prayer. Verse 39, when all the people saw this, when they saw what God did, when they saw that God answered miraculously, it wasn't a trick. It was for real. He said, when they saw this, the people fell on their faces and began to cry out to God. They fell on their faces. God was revealing to their hearts that they needed to ask forgiveness. They needed to turn from their wicked ways. They needed to focus on God. They needed to ask God to come and be personal to them. It says they fell prostrate on the ground. And they cried out, and they cried out this, Lord, the Lord, he's God. The Lord, he's God. And revival came on Israel. I want you folks to think about that. These people had gone through tough times. They had gone through a time when it didn't rain, their crops didn't grow. It was a time when it seemed like everything was going wrong. God wasn't there. But God was using those circumstances to get those folks to focus on what was important, to focus on God. Elijah the prophet, he was the one man, the one prophet that stood up for God. And it was willing to challenge evil, no matter what the cost. He was outnumbered badly, except he had God. And then lastly, I want you to see this. Elijah was bold. The scripture says, Elijah commanded, seize all the false prophets of Baal and Asherah, 
Seize the 850 prophets. Take them down to the Kishon Valley. And they took them down. And the scripture says, Moses had them slaughtered there. Wow. Uh, any way you look at that, that's capital punishment. <laughs> Moses had them slaughtered there. And I read that, and I'm, I, I read it, and I know some people are going, well, wow, I thought we had a God of love. I thought we had a God of peace. But sometimes, folks, you have to stand up for what's right. You have to stand against evil and wrong. Sometimes you have to take a stand, and you can't continue to waver between both sides. What's right is right, but what is wrong is wrong. The scripture tells me that the Lord himself is going to come down from heaven and we're going to meet him in the air. Both the ones that have already passed and the ones that are alive are going to meet the Lord in the air and we will spend eternity with God. But it also says those who wouldn't believe, the those that would not bend their knee to God, which simply means they wouldn't bow before God and acknowledge that he was God and they needed his help. Those that wouldn't bow... It says on that judgment day, they'll all bow. They'll, everyone will bow. The problem will be it'll be too late. Right now, we're in the period of grace. We have the opportunity and the chance to find the Lord. If the Lord is stirring your heart, if the Lord is tugging on you, if the Lord is making it uneasy for you when you hear these words, I'm telling you, it's because he loves you. It's because he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you. And he wants you to come to him. Jesus has a gift for you, but it's not your gift until you receive it. I'm going to tell you today, if God is stirring your heart in any way, it's because he loves you. And he wants to come into your heart and make you a different person. He wants to give you the fire in your heart and revival. There is going to be a judgment day. And that day is for those who do not believe. And the scripture is very blunt about it. Hell was not created for us. Hell was created for the devil and the demons and all his imps, their judgment has been sealed in a fiery pit called hell. But if you refuse to accept the free gift of salvation, the scripture is very clear. You will spend eternity away from God in a tormenting hell. I don't want to go there. I want to live with the Lord. I don't know what all God has planned, but it's going to be a spectacular place. It's going to be a place that says that every generation will love, and that's got to be a great place. I mean, in our church, we have like five generations of people. It's hard enough just to get music that five generations can tolerate. Yet God has got a place that is so awesome and beautiful and wonderful, and we spend time with him that it'll be, it'll be the most important thing. This life, about that long compared to eternity. If you're here today, I want you to realize God loves you. I want you to realize that Jesus died for you. I want you to realize that today is the day of salvation and you can receive Christ as your Savior. This story also relates another thing to me. Very simple. This is, God is not playing church. This is very important to God. He was willing to send his one and only son, Jesus, to die on a cross. The one that never sinned would take the sins of the lost world on himself to pay the price for our sins. So God's not playing church. God is serious. I want to challenge you today to think about it. I want you to challenge you today to consider living for the Lord. And then I want to challenge you today to stand up for what you believe and be counted for God. Thank you again for coming, tuning us in today. Would love and appreciate it if you would uh, uh, send this link 
to someone that you know that might need to hear this message, that you would share it with others. We would appreciate that. We want to thank you for uh, coming today and listening to this message. May God bless you. May you feel his presence. And may the God of creation set your heart on fire. Thank you again. This is Pastor Jim Clark of Crossroads Community Church. Thanking you for tuning us in today. May God bless.